Thank you, Zoom. Uh, and it's also being live streamed on Facebook uh, for current viewing and also uh, for later viewing on our various uh, social media platforms. Uh, in addition, we have a request that people turn off their virtual or blurry backgrounds. We've had some people with some vision uh, issues that find it difficult to uh, follow us uh, when we have blurred or a virtual background. So thank you very much. One last piece of advertising uh, before I turn it over to our speakers. Um, and I wanted to highlight that our 13th annual CLGS Georgia Harkness Lecture will take place on Thursday, October 20th. It will be online. And we're really thrilled that we have uh, Professor Julia Watts Belser, who will be speaking on Queer Crip Revelation, Disability Dance, Jewish Text, and the Sacred Potency of Difference. And I'll put a link to that uh, in the chat box. So without any further ado, I will turn this over to CLGS visiting scholar, uh, Rabbi Dr. Jay Michelson. Take it away, Jay. Thank you, Bernie. And thank you to Jane and to CLGS uh, for convening this event. Um, I thought I would just kind of frame a little bit of our conversation and maybe actually then bounce it to uh, know me a little bit. First, uh, this personally for me is kind of a fun and big deal moment in that I've been working on this work with, uh, for Jake, with Jacob Frank for almost 20 years. And uh, it's been kind of a sideline to a lot of the other work that I've been doing. And now to have the fruits of that work out from Oxford University Press and uh, the book is being published officially tomorrow. But uh, thanks to the miracle of Amazon, if that's what it is, uh, it's available now already uh, in a variety of formats. And to be able to share it here is, uh, is, really, an, is really an honor. Um, the issue of sexuality and, and gender, primarily sexuality and uh, Sabbateanism, Frankism and Hasidism, which really form a continuum of Jewish mystical movements, uh, the issue is, is rather fraught. Um, Sabbateanism, like most heretical movements, became associated with sort of libertine sexuality and is probably the predominant association with it even today for among scholars or, or the folks who are aware of it uh, as a non non-statistical example. Uh, I posted about this event on Facebook and some the majority of the questions were actually about the extent to which sexual transgression was present uh, in the Frankist movement. Um, as I try to show in the book, in one chapter of the book, uh, we actually know very little about what went on uh, in terms of sexual ritual, sexual behavior, and sexual mores within these communities. Uh, and the amount of both sort of general attention and scholarly attention to what might be termed sexual deviance within these movements, I think says more about the preoccupations of heresiologists than actually the phenomena that they are studying. So that's kind of a certain uh, disclaimer at the beginning. Uh, I, there is a, a really interesting fertile vein of uh, discourse and praxis around sexuality and what we might even term sacred sexuality in these movements. And at the same time, there's an exaggeration uh, and a focusing on that uh, on, on that aspect of these movements to the exclusion of, of others, of other aspects. So we're entering into a conversation that is on the one hand, I think really interesting in and of itself with the awareness that the othering of sexuality and sexual minorities within a sort of normative religious practice takes place in these contexts as well, in these discussions of these movements. Um, Nomi, I thought before I kind of turn to you, I would and uh, I would maybe just give a short introduction of the movement in general for maybe five or so minutes. Does that sound uh, does that sound good to you? That is wonderful. Is there a tech support who can help figure out why I can't turn my video on? I think it's the Tsneas Patrol. <laughs> Just kidding. I uh, just said that that was finally, the modest, okay, that, okay. that was the modesty here, here patrol from the okay, now are. I can focus. <laughs> Excellent. It's good to see you. <laughs> nice to see you, Jay. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and uh, as I've said over our email communications, it's a real treat to have this opportunity to talk with you. I think um, it's now been many years since you wrote that book, uh, or wrote that article rather on sort of homo sociality and Hasidic communities. And that article blew my mind. It was an article, right? I think it was an article uh, many years I've ago. I've said the same thing in so many different ways in so many different places. <laughs> uh, it really 
It changed a lot for me. That article changed a lot for me. We'll talk about it maybe a little bit later on, yeah. both in terms of how I understood these communities, but also in terms of how I understood what sort of queer studies and religion might look like. Uh, mm -hmm. that we weren't necessarily looking. It was a little bit of a parallel for me of the uh, Adrian Rich essay, uh, Compulsory mm -hmm. Heterosexuality and Lesbian Existence, that we're, we're not necessarily looking for certain genital behaviors or sexual behaviors, but we might be, if we have a, a less of a narrow uh, definition of what we're looking for, we might find much more that's actually really fascinating and, and queer in an interesting way. And that's true. That's been true for me in my mm -hmm. exploration of Sabatinism and Frankism in particular. Um, so for the 99.9% .9 of people in the world who aren't familiar with these Jewish heretical movements, I've now gotten pretty good at giving a short introduction to them. So I thought I would do that and then and then uh, get to this kind of conversation. So in 1665, uh, 1666, there was a mass messianic movement in European Jewry. As many as, many as one third of European Jews came to believe that an individual known as Shabtai Tzvi or Sabbatai Tzvi was the Messiah incarnate. Shabtai Tzvi himself, a very fascinating character, wouldn't be out of place today as sort of a roving eccentric prophet, may, may be neurodivergent in one way or another, um, and you know, speaking prophecy. Uh, he happened, however, he clearly was possessed of a lot of charisma as well. He had a prophet publicist, uh, someone who I've always been looking for in my career, by the way, uh, Nathan of Gaza. And this movement really tore uh, traditional Judaism apart. Uh, both because it was a rebellion and a, and a heretical rebellion, and also because many uh, leaders in positions of authority became believers. So it wasn't that this was only a rebellion against rabbinic authority, although it was that. Many rabbinic authorities themselves came to believe uh, in Shabtai Tzvi and actually said that if you don't believe that he's the Messiah, you have a lack of faith. That mass movement ended in 1666 when Shabtai Tzvi was given the choice by the Ottoman Sultan to convert to Islam or to die. Uh, at that moment, many of his followers believed that he would take the crown from the Ottoman Sultan and restore Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel and usher in the Messianic age. Uh, instead, he did convert uh, and he became a kind of minor official in the Sultan's court and the mass movement ended. But the Messianic movement did not end entirely. Uh, in two different communities, a, a smaller group of a subset of Shabtai Tzvi's believers continued to believe. So a number of them converted to Islam outwardly, just like Shabtai Tzvi had done, but maintained their secret heretical Jewish practice. Uh, they were called the Dernmeh, which sort of is a, a disparaging term, kind of like the turncoats or the traitors. They called themselves Ma'aminim, believers. There were also large number of Jews who outwardly returned to normative Judaism, but secretly, again, uh, continued their beliefs and practice uh, that Shabtai Tzvi was the Messiah. These heretical currents, particularly in the Jewish community, bubbled along for around 100 years. Rabbinic authorities were aware of them. There were some prominent rabbis who were secretly Sabbatean believers, um, but Primarily, not entirely, but primarily, and Elisheva Karlbach's book called The Pursuit of Heresy talks about this at length. Primarily, it was kind of, there were attempts to just squelch it and make it all go away until uh, the advent of Jacob Frank, uh, who was born in 1726. In 1755, 56, 57, he assumes leadership of a sect, one of many sects of Sabbatean believers. Um, but at some point in 1757, his sect was either exposed or accused of engaging in a sexual ritual, a kind of uh, eroticized version of Simchat Torah, the Jewish holiday where uh, Jews dance around the Torah. The Torah is meant to sort of reflect or embody the divine feminine, the Shekhinah, Malchut. Uh, in the Sabbatean ritual, a teenage girl was used, used, I guess, exploited, used in that, in that role. Uh, and just as I tripped over that word, we don't really have a lot of the voices of the women who were involved in these rituals. So it's very difficult to assess the level of consent or coercion or blend thereof uh, that take place. The, the Sabbatean movement, as um, um, Ada Rappaport Alpert has shown in her incredible book, Women in the Messianic Heresy of Shabtai Tzvi, the Sabbatean movement was the first Jewish movement or community to, to have women in positions of temporal power and spiritual power. There were female sect leaders, community leaders, prophetesses, uh, and sages. 
At the same time, again, we don't have uh, as many records of these women speaking for themselves. And so it's always a one of the challenges, and I think it's a good second maybe, maybe disclaimer at the beginning, is uh, that there's not a utopia here that I'm proposing, like some queer utopia that once existed, and that's fantastic. There are really interesting queer disruptions of normative Jewish sexual ethics in the context of extremely problematic power arrangements, continued misogynistic teachings, and so on. Uh, this ritual was exposed when a, a, teen, so a teenage girl was uh, half naked and danced, uh, there were men and, and women dancing around her and kissing her breasts uh, as men would do in a traditional normative Jewish environment, kissing the Torah. Whether this actually happened or not, uh, I talk about in my book, but that became secondary to the accusation. And over a series of disputations that took place, finally culminating in 1759, eventually Jacob Frank led the largest mass conversion to Christianity in Jewish history. Somewhere between three and 5,000 Jews converted over a period of a few months in 1759. This was the end of the sort of toleration of heretical Sabbateanism by rabbinic authorities. It was also, incidentally, many people, we could even, well, we could do a little poll, but we, many people know that in traditional Judaism, you're not supposed to study Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, until you're, in, you're 40 years old and you, you're learned and so forth. Those restrictions were announced in response to the Jacob Frank uh, episode uh, and the mass, her the mass apostasy that took place. It was seen that these, believed that these mystical teachings were too dangerous for the masses. Um, Frank's career did not end, however. Uh, he did not become simply, he could have simply converted to Christianity and, and, uh, and lived the rest of his life, but in fact his sect continued, uh, not naming him as the Messiah. Actually, Jacob Frank said the Messiah would be a woman, and specifically a kind of perennialist figure known as the Maiden, a sort of female archetype who incarnated again and again uh, in, various, in various forms including uh, his own daughter, Jacob Frank's daughter, Eve. So this, uh, this maiden figure, which kind of combines aspects of the Shekhinah, aspects of the Black Virgin of Shostakhova, where Frank was imprisoned for a number of years, and aspects of other uh, teachings around the divine feminine. This is the messianic figure, not Jacob Frank. In a wonderful aside, Frank then says that the, the sort of the dark woman, the demoness, the enchantress, the one who you want to avoid, is the one who promotes sexual repression and gets, gets traps men into uh, traps men into re reading books and oppressing other women, other oppressing, uh, oppressing women. And it's these forces of repression that are actually the evil, the Sitra Ahra. That in itself is a that's a pretty radical uh, inversion of traditional Jewish conceptions of repression and libertinism when it comes to sexual expression. So the Frank is, Frank is thrown in jail for 12 years. Upon his release, thanks to geopolitics, uh, he lives out the rest of his life kind of as a sect leader, a little bit like an 18th century cult leader, uh, creates or dictates uh, the work that we have now called the Words of the Lord, uh, which are his oral teachings recorded mostly in 1784. Um, and while his movement ended uh, and mostly ended in failure upon his death and then the death of his daughter uh, many years later, the men, much of what Frank preached anticipated currents which would be become dominant, uh, not just in Judaism, but in Western religious uh, circles. The notion that one could, the notion that traditional Jewish theodicy, that the wicked are punished and the righteous are rewarded, is not true in, in a literal sense. Uh, the conception that one could have what we might see as a spiritual practice, I want to suggest that's really a sublimated erotic messianic consciousness without the sort of boundaries of normative religion, which is something, again, that may, many people may, may take for granted today, that originated with that movement. Um, and the idea that there should be a kind of a Jewish return to history and, and Jewish power for better and for worse, I would say largely for worse, this too anticipated later developments uh, in Jewish history. So that's my in very short thumbnail. I would only just add, and knowing with this, I could transition maybe to you. I think when I started learning, I, I went to graduate school to study Hasidism and sort of abandoned that to instead study heresy. I saw those as two very different phenomena. There was like the Hasidic movement, which came along in Podolia in the 1750s, and there was the Sabbatean Frankist movement that came along in Podolia in the 1750s, but these were very different. 
Uh, that seems not to really be the case. The Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism, was very aware of Jacob Frank, mourned the uh, the excision of his sect from the Jewish people. Rabbi Nachman of Braslav plagiarized stories from Yaakov Frank uh, in particular, which I show word by word in, in my book. And more broadly, the notion that one could have an eroticized spiritual messianic consciousness outside of traditional messianic history, but instead in an eroticized ritual is something that's actually held in common. Just that one of the rituals is kosher and the other is very trafe, not kosher. The kosher ritual would be to infuse contemplative and ecstatic prayer with eroticism and erotic energy. And there's many of those texts in Hasidism. The not so kosher version uh, would be to actually infuse that ritual with sex, with sexual practice that existed in the Durnamek communities that Frank came from, the ones who had converted outwardly to Islam, and it continued in, in his own community. And to me, these are just two slightly different uh paths along the same basic road uh that that takes us to maybe where we are now in in the new age and in spiritual in in uh in neo hasidism in particular i should also say as i one last thing my husband just handed me the first copy of the book that i've been able to hold <laughs> so you get the, there's the screenshot of me holding the book which uh it's real now <laughs> so thank you there's the summary No, we are muted. Um, hi, hi, thank congratulations. What a wonderful moment that we're seeing. Um, and also just what a fabulous topic for a book. Um, and maybe I could just say one little anecdote, which is that I grew up hearing about Jacob Frank, which is not what you would expect from a girl in a Hasidic home in Brooklyn. And that's because um, a family story was that when my father was 13 years old, he was poking around in the town archives and he found uh, some kind of letter about Jacob Frank. And my father grew up in the town of Buchach, which apparently was a center of Frankist thought. Um, and he sent a copy of this document to Mayor Balaban, the first Jewish studies professor in Poland. And Balaban wrote him back a letter saying, dear Professor Seidman, not understanding he was corresponding with a 13 year old. Um, and later my father went and studied with Balaban. So this was a story I grew up on and it fascinated me. And I'm not surprised that a 13 year old Hasidic boy would be fascinated by Jacob Frank, right? There are these moments in history that as if they reach out of the past and they grab us by the lapel. Um, and Jacob Frank is one of those moments, um, or the story of Jacob Frank is one of those moments that 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 has a kind of power to transcend its incredibly weird, particular, local, eccentric details, and speak to us as if we're right there. Um, now, my question is, to what extent? And I think that both. I've heard you or I've read you and I've heard Otto Rappaport actually at the GTU say that this particular kind of fascination is a form of misreading. That there's something about the Frankist movement that we don't get because we're so turned on by it. Hmm. Um, and by the way, this is a queer, right? Zoe Wyman Kelman talks about the queer touching that's possible through history. Right, we touch people not only when they're there in the room with us, you touched some people through this book um, and you will touch many more. Um, so what is it about this topic that we're liable to get wrong in our very desire to touch it? I love that question, thank you. I think there's something there about the Jewish queer search for a usable past mm. right so we know the search for a usable past and where you know my my touchstone for this is another adrian rich text right diving into the wreck where you know our names don't appear in in these books and we have to read between the lines and find where the queerness is and sometimes that can be a kind of flattening of the text you know so the you know the ruth the, what what the ruth and naomi relationship I think is one which Adrian Rich herself looked at where 
this is a complicated, interesting queer relationship that may or may not conform in a, in a kind of easy way to retrieval. The same with David and Jonathan, um, which was much more of a warrior love convention than any kind of, let's say, egalitarian same-sex relationship. And here too, but maybe less famously, it's I, there's something just profoundly attractive about this notion that there's this explosion in eroticized mystical consciousness that takes place. And that <laughs> that turns me on intellectually and in, in, in whatever other way. And that may be, you know, it would be very, I think I, I started my, you know, one of my first disclaimers was these, these the, the, he's not a good guy. Jacob Frank's not a good guy. Um, some of what was said about him is almost certainly false. There was a longstanding claim that he committed incest with his daughter. There's no evidence for that. In fact, when he talks about incest, it's because he designated his close followers, brothers and sisters by title, not by by not by biology, uh, and they were they were in a kind of some sexualized uh, community, not unlike a 20th or 21st century cult. Um, so, all right, he didn't do that, but he did do a lot of other sort of mean things and said a lot of abusive things. And one thing that's interesting- Blood libel against the Jews. Right, so there was in that period that I alluded to 1757 to 59, I did the short version, but there were actually two series of disputations. Uh, the first of which was kind of, it was presided over by a bitterly anti-Semitic bishop who uh, persuaded, if we could use that word, I might say coerced uh, members of the Frankist community, not Jacob Frank himself, but members of the community to agree uh, to the blood, that the blood libel, the myth that Jews uh, killed Christian babies and used their blood uh, for matzah uh, was true. Uh, and that led to violence and to the burning of the Talmud. And that led to uh, a variety of um, tragedies. Uh, incidentally, what then happened is that the bishop suddenly dropped dead. So if you believe in divine providence or the magic, that the possibility of Kabbalists to do black magic, to argue, there, there is a great example. Uh, the bishop just drops dead. A new bishop comes in who's not on the side of the Frankists, who's not in, as overtly anti-Semitic. And that's what led to the, the Frankist sect uh, losing the second disputation. But for a brief period there, a few months, six months, three to six months, um, the contra-Talmudists, as the Frankist sect was known at the time, uh, were victorious. And it looked like they, might have, they may have been able to set up an autonomous community from the Jewish community. But that came at, the, at a price of colluding in some of the worst anti-Semitism that one could imagine. Um, so there is, and for folks who have read the novel, The Books of Jacob by Olga Tukarczyk, this period is really well captured in that uh, novel. I'm happy that mine is the shorter book on Frankism to come out in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that gives me an edge, uh, but yeah. her novel is, is truly masterful. Um, and one thing that I think it really does capture is maybe responsive to your question, that there's a, I think she really captures the kind of mystification of that period, right? These were Jews living in extreme poverty and extreme marginalization, persecution. And many of them had had their hopes dashed, their messianic hopes dashed, not, you know, just only a few decades earlier. Uh, and here came this bizarre, this bizarre figure um, preaching a radical anti-Torah and antinomianism, the idea that the, the God does exist and wants you to disobey the Torah and all religious law. And there, there's, it somehow became a mass movement uh, as Shabtai Tzvi had a had, uh, hundred years ago. I try not to take antinomianism too personally. I don't know if you do. <laughs> um, Jay, I think what I meant to say, let me try to put my question into greater focus and also remembering Ada's point. So Ada of blessed memory, um, what she said is something like that we tend to view sexuality is kind of the bottom line, maybe after Freud, the explanatory principle for everything. So, oh, you get a heresy and there's, you know, this ritual involving kissing the breasts of a young maiden. You're like, aha, it's all about sex, we knew. And what she said is that this particular ritual with the wife swapping, I think she talked about wife swapping. Mm -hmm. She said it was done in the way there was also a ritual um, eating of tallow, mm -hmm. which is not kosher. Um, so the ritual antinomianism, if we want to call it that, the breaking of Jewish law, 
was done in a kind of spirit of intent, religious intent, intentionality. And our, aha, those horny, you know, ancestors of ours is a kind of misreading of, of what that was all about. Um, and our, at which I think leads to the next thing, which is that our queer desire to touch these ancestors um, it may be over, or, or maybe if it's queer, it doesn't have to be faithful in the same way. And I wanna ask you about that too, but that's my next question. So I don't know if that, that, that puts a finer focus on my question. It does actually, thank you. Yeah, so I I completely agree with Ada's reading of, of sexual ritual in the Sabbatean and Frankist communities. One of the most remarkable ones, which probably no one on this call has heard of, uh, was right on the eve of the Frankist conversion, Frank conducted a sexual anti-mass in a certain way. He had a crucifix and put candles on the on the two on the on the edge ends of the crucifix and extinguished the lights. And there was then a group we might use the word orgy, but there was a group sexual ritual that took place at that time. And this was just at the time when the sect was in this incredibly traumatic transition period, right? I mean, converting to Christianity. Um, this was in, in a certain way might be understood as kind of um, communicating very clearly that this was not going to be a sincere conversion, uh, right? In as in as stark a way as possible. The same with the eating of the tallow, which by the way, that was a uh, Chaya Shore, one of the female leaders of, uh, of a Sabbatine community I mentioned earlier. Uh, she used that as a test of faith, right? Will you eat this treif uh, thing? This not kosher bit of, of beef fat. Um, and it's, I, for me, I, I, I'm interested in the experience of antinomianism and what that is. I think Rachel Lior, who was my dissertation advisor and uh, really my, my guiding teacher in this work, she just pointed out, you know, if you want to have sex, go have sex. You don't have to write about it, right? It's there, there is this, this sense in, in some of the scholarship of Frankism, and this goes right through Gershom Sholem and others, that just like you said, sex is the bottom line and all of this elaborate theology was some excuse to get laid, which is just ridiculous, right? People, especially especially men, were having all kinds of sex. They just didn't write about it necessarily and didn't make a theology out of it. So, mm -hmm. right, there's this reductive idea that like, aha, uh -huh, that's right, oh, just like, you know, insert 20th century or 21st century abusive male cult leader. It was really all about the sex. And and uh, I think Ada conclusively demonstrated that that's, that's a, I would say a silly reading of of the sexual antinomianism that it actually was in the service of a kind of consciousness transformation that was mm -hmm. a profound rupture from normative religious identity. I mean, again, just imagine, right? You're in the 18th century, and you know this this is the most wild violation of Jewish law that could be possible. What what does that convey in the consciousness of a of a sect member? Okay, Jay, I just imagine that you're arousing so many questions. So I'm just gonna end with one more just so we have time for them. And I'm gonna squeeze in two sub questions cause I'm, I'm only allowing myself one more question. So the first one is probably obvious, which is um, in what way, so I always thought that the whole queer Jewish discourse around um, you know, Jews as queer, or maybe the Frankists as queer. It was a kind of unusual use of the term queer, which normally means a sexual minority, unless you use the universalizing um, definition um, that doesn't refer to an entire ethnic group, or in this case, an entire possible. I don't know if you mean it to refer to Frankists in general, or Frank himself, or. So I wanna ask you about that. And then part B, I warned you, there were two parts. Part B is um, you've made a very dramatic, um, for those of us who, are, who have been charting your fascinating career, um, you've, you've made a very dramatic shift from, um, I guess I would call it constructive theology, um, queer studies, constructive theology to, I, I hope I'm not mischaracterizing your work, I'm not sure how you would describe it, um, to a much more academic kind of writing. And I noticed that your book almost doesn't use the lens of queer studies. And I'm wondering, you know, why that is. And I, I'm just it, very, very curious about your own conversion into a 
if I can say it, a kind of straight academic. Oh, good um, Lord. <laughs> queerified for the purposes of this particular talk. Is it because, I don't know, your dissertation committee or Oxford Press or, you know, what is it that made this book? Um, sorry, I don't, you know, got, that, that must be the only time in your life you've been called straight, right? <laughs> It's not frequent. But I, I, no, I get it, though. I, so it, for okay, me, yeah, that's my yeah, set yeah, of yeah. questions to you. Yeah, that one I'll do first. And then because the second one, I want to transition to a question for you, actually. So this will work well for me. Um, yeah, I, I, I consider myself a, a very lowercase queer academic in the sense just of the broad sense of weird. Right. I mean, I have a position at, at Chicago Theological Seminary, a, a, a sort of position here at, at CLGS, but I, I'm not on, I'm not, I've never been a tenure track professor. I've never been. So I, I see myself as a, some marginal figure at best. I actually just got in a sort of weird email conversation with a, a, a well-known scholar of Jewish mysticism that he was insulted by something that I said. And I was like, you're insulted by me? What? I have no, what, what, can you, what could you mean? Um, I do, you know, I think there, for me, Frank really seduced me. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I went to go study Hasidism and, and that was more continuous with some of my, I guess, theological work. That's, that project turned into my book, Everything is God, which, which works with some Hasidic teachings. But it really, you know, you, you always kind of know the end game with some of the, with these Hasidic teachers in a certain way, no matter how elaborate the theology, it's going to come back to Torah and mitzvahs. It's going to come back to a traditional Jewish frame. And I just found all of this interesting theology to be not that interesting because that's where it ends up. With Frank, you never know where it's going to end up. I mean, he tells the most bizarre tales and stories that it just, it, and I kept chasing him down. I worked really hard to try, well, this must come from somewhere. And a lot of them came from his imagination or from, you know, maybe synthesizing folklore and, and a lot of other sources. And so this, that was the seduction for me. Um, I do think though, you know, I wrote a, a piece a few years ago, also a kind of more conventional academic piece on queer theology and Kabbalah, uh, essentially. And uh, I think a subtitle was Resources and Reservations. Because there is, if you're looking for, certainly if you're, if you're looking for femininity in theology, the Kabbalah is the place in Jewishness until the recent period where it's found. If they're, if they're looking for a sacralization of sexuality rather than a repression for it, that again is where it's found. You know, in the Sabbatean movement, Shabtai Tzvi was a very conventionally queer figure, by which I mean, uh, not only did he have male lovers, but he was understood as having a female soul and a male body. I hesitate to project back categories of transgender, but whatever that meant for someone in the 17th century, he was understood to have a female soul and a male body. Um, he was seen, his, his, it was his wife, Sarah, who was actually the kind of... Um, much more in much more of the leadership position uh, in the in the community, um, and there were these amazing homoerotic hymns which were created by male followers of Shabtai Tzvi praising his quote unquote feminine beauty. We'll be singing those hymns on Tuesday at a book launch event I'm doing in Brooklyn. Uh, oh Basya Shechter Basya Shechter has set a couple of them to music, and um, I'm very excited for that as well. Um, you know, I did the same thing with my what? book. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> yes, I hired Basia to set some songs, some of the Beis Yaakov, uh, I mean, we had the music, we had tunes for it. Okay, sorry for interrupting. No, that's incredible. I, I, have, I had no idea. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, uh, Jacob Frank was more of, I would say, a queering of the queer. Uh, his understanding of Jewishness is similar a little bit to some of how uh, Daniel Bayarin's work gets read. Also similar to, um, why am I forgetting? Oh, uh, Otto Weininger, right? The sort of horrifying, queer, self-hating Jewish bisexual writer who felt that Jews were quote unquote feminine and Christians were masculine and Jews had to become more masculine. Frank has a very similar view uh, with all of that, all that that entails. His notion is that Yaakov and Esau, Jacob and Esau need to be brought together, the sort of temporal power, which he associated with masculinity and Christianity and the kind of spiritual understanding that he associated with femininity. Uh, and and Jewishness. Um, obviously, all of those have a lot of problematic aspects, the binary and the essentialism and, and, and so much more. Um, he did have this interesting, some, one of his followers wrote, and Ada, Ada wrote a, a paper which was included in her book based on this uh, very bizarre 
proto-feminist but also misogynistic Frankist reading of the emancipation, why the emancipation of women would, would bring the messianic age because women embodied sensuality and sexuality and sexual liberation was gonna be the mark of the messianic age. So a wonderful mishmash of feminism, anti-feminism, <laughs> misogyny, liberationism, um, and uh, Otta's treatment of that essay is, is I think really interesting and, and I, I take it up in the book as well. So I, I think I, I take your point. There is sort of this, but I but but I think even in the queerness, I think what's interesting about the queerness in Sabatinism and Frankism is also that it is continuing, that there is something queer about mysticism, um, and that you know for me, I would like to turn this answer into a question, which is a nice traditional Jewish thing to do, uh, for you, which is where. You know, I think as I'm as I'm reconstructing your work, and forgive me if I do it in a sort of haphazard and terrible way, uh, there is a there is a certain kind of displacement of eroticism in some of these Hasidic communities, which again grew up in the same places at the same time with the same. They were called Sabbateans. They were called, oh, you guys are just more heretics. And at first, I thought that was just a slander when I was learning about that, you know, 25 years ago. But it wasn't just a slander. Outwardly, they really looked like another heretical sect. They were outside of rabbinic authority. Uh, they were they they favored mysticism over traditional Talmud study. Uh, they had these ecstatic eroticized practices, not corporealized as the Sabbateans did, but sublimated into some notion of of uh, zivug of sexual congress with the divine feminine. Do you feel like I'm reaching here, or do you feel like there are aspects of continuity in the kind of intense eroticized mystical prayer? Which was taken, which took place in homosocial environments in Chas in Hasidism. Do I feel that you're reaching by making a connection between the sexual organization of Hasidic life and the sexual organization of Frankist life? In particular, around prayer, ritual, and messian and and displaced or what yeah. Sean called neutralized messianism. It actually. Thank you. It actually explains something about Hasidism, which is you have one, you have one movement um, that burned itself out very quickly, and you have another movement that's exploding. Um, and if you want to see these as kind of laboratory experiments in not only the erotic organization of society, and they're both radical experiments in the erotic organization of society, then you have one for whatever reason. You have one that turned out to be in some ways more successful, in some ways. I mean, less radical, more successful, uh, quickly institutionalized, successful at the cost of a lot of its erotic energy, um, which maintained, you know, whatever heterosexual impulses it had, it, um, it restricted them, it de-eroticized them, right, through marriage, the, through arranged marriage and whatever. It, it used a kind of erotic discourse um, to eroticize homosocial relations, right? The Rebbe, the relationship between the Rebbe and Hasidim, the relationship with Hasidim. So in some ways it's both, it's more queer than Frankism because Frankism went all out with actual men kissing young girls' breasts. It doesn't happen in most Hasidic courts. Um, it's more queer, it's less queer because that kind of stuff doesn't happen. And it's more queer because um, it, sort of shielded itself from a certain kind of wildness by um, turning that kind of heterosexuality into a kind of metaphor and locating it almost entirely within the male sphere. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. I, but I'm just, what I'm you have is, is a kind of, I would say what you have is a, a system that uses one of the things that I think does speak to us today, that uses eroticism both in terms of erotic practice, right, which are not just in the bedroom, in the marital bedroom, but somehow manifest themselves as part of the community life. Um, so both of them go there and both of them add that to, we think of whatever modern sexual society as being so liberated and open, um, it still locates sex almost entirely within the couple and the marriage and the relationship and the family. Um, it has found, let's say, few uses or marginal uses to um, energize entire communities through erotic means. 
And it also, um, I think, really underutilizes the kind of um, discursive di um, dimension of eroticism that that you're talking about, right? It's not just um, it's not just the actual sexual practice, but the kind of construction of meaning. In this case, the the, the interplay between antinomianism and erotic ritual, etc. So I think those are those are things that that provide a kind of richer in some way, maybe crazier, more abusive, more, um, you know, Eros has a role, ha has various roles to play that are almost missing in our society um, in, which, in which supposedly we have the big, you know, lollipop of we get to have these different kinds of sex. Yeah, 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 gay marriage, straight marriage, blah, blah. Sorry, no offense. But what we don't have is marriage between you know, uh, uh, I mean, this is probably good for the maiden, the maiden who symbolizes the virgin, who symbolizes God, versus, you know, and some follower, that's been quieted, that kind of erotic energy, for the most part. I mean, maybe, I mean, now I'll turn it back to you. Do you agree? Well, I want to go to questions. Okay, and... let's, uh, let's go to questions. Yeah. Who's going to feel them, you or me, or are we doing it through the chat? I'm, I'm going to feel them. Okay. And so that you two don't have to. Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, I think we still have a few enough people, although it's really a big group and I wanna thank everybody who's joined us. I'm Rabbi Jane Littman. I uh, staff the Jewish, um, the Jewish part of CLGS. Uh, I think we can do it by people raising their hands um, using the reactions button. Uh, I, I have a couple questions. I, I'd like to, both of you sort of moved th this discussion into the issue of uh, Frankism and Hasidism. And Jay, you brought up the um, reform Judaism and modernity. And I, uh, I want to sort of push on that a little bit. Do you think that um, you said that Frankism has uh, aspects of modernity in it, which I certainly agree. And I thought it would be good to for you to talk about the queerness of of is is was the modern world queer is that a queerness and um did it lose its queerness through uh did it maintain any of its queerness in gender relations or uh, sexual relations and how come uh ra radical antinomianism of uh, reform judaism didn't get quite the hostility as a uh, not quite as frankism got Sure. Yeah. So for me, so one one thing, so uh, just a little background, Gershom Sholem, pioneering scholar of Kabbalah, had a, a bold thesis that a lot of the energy of reform, Jewish and the Jewish enlightenment, Haskalah, and then Jewish reform actually came from Kabbalah by way of Sabbatinism and Frankism. Um, that's basically mostly not true. Uh, that that sort of theory is not true. It mostly came from Christianity and Jew, Jewish emancipation and, and contacts with uh, contacts with Christianity. There were some exceptions. The Prague Frankists became the Prague Haskalah, but I think actually rather than put the queerness in through that line to modernity, it, it was almost an embarrassment to some of those rationalists. Um, I think the, fra the, 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 the aspect of sexual liberation, what's interesting about that text I mentioned before is something for, it's called something for the female sex, uh, is that it's, it's still quite queer, both in the sense of sexual liberation and boundary crossing and weirdness, right? It's this notion that the messianic age is going to be an age of erotic liberation. That's very different from how I understand the German reformers, <laughs> of, uh, you know, of their of the, and their sort of tight buttoned up rationalism that what we want is an edifying religious experience that will philosophically elevate us and will become more ethical. You know, maybe the two sides are just shadows of each other. Frank fails many ethical tests, right? As do as do these mess these mystical movements that privilege eroticism over ethics, right? That. That's, we don't want that in the 21st century. Uh, so maybe there is kind of a marriage of heaven and hell here, a marriage of the Apollonian and Dionysian with the mystical element of Frankism representing the queer Dionysian liberation impulse, but the reformist aspects 
the proto reformist aspects representing more the yeah the Apollonian and ethical. I don't see the modernity sides of Franck as being the queer sides. I, in fact, I see the kind of anti modern eroticism sides as being the ones that convey the queerness. There was Naomi, a question. Did, oh, Naomi, did you want to say anything about that or? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a road not taken, right? So um, because of the way that reform developed, it's really the lens is, it's not a countercultural antinomianism. It's a kind of adoption of um, 19th century German bourgeois sexual roles. Um, sorry, I mean, I realize that's not reform anymore, but that's what it was at the beginning. I mean, there's a gender analysis to be done there. Um, and, but I, you know, I agree with Jay that there's a pretty radical break between Frankism and Haskalah Enlightenment reform. Um, that that particular link that Sholem um, described incorrectly, I believe, too. And Mazel, did you want to? You had a question? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, and this has all been just amazing. Um, but I was curious about if we know kind of the intent of the conversion to Christianity and whether it was whether it was more actually about Christianity or about Judaism, whether it was using Christianity, you know, as a means to still engaging with Judaism by rejecting it, or if it was a like genuine religious resonance with it. Great. Yeah, thanks um, for that question. Uh, until, so the primary historian of the Frankist movement, a scholar named Pavel Macheco, his book, The Mixed Multitude, is kind of still the definitive history of the movement. Prior to his work, the sort of idea was that this was part of, that the conversion of, to Christianity was voluntary, the Frankist community chose to do it, just like Shabtai Tzvi had, had chosen to convert to Islam, so the Frankist community chose to convert to Christianity. So that would make it more, maybe a little bit more of, about Christianity and the messianic uh, aspirations of, of the movement. But uh, actually, the, the, the conversion, the mass conversion was not consensual. Um, it was also a convert or die situation. Uh, the entire community was at risk of being put to death uh, as for being heretics. Because um, you, you could be a Jew in Catholic Poland, you could be a Christian, but you couldn't be a heretic, you couldn't be neither. And um, so it's a tough question to answer in a certain way. Post hoc, you know, Frank's the text, the one that I studied, focused on in the book, uh, was written 25 years after, 25? Yeah, 25 years after these events. And he has a rationalization for the, for the conversion that this was to unite Jacob and Esau, as I mentioned before, and that this was, he had, a, he had an idea that the Christians pos possessed the maiden but didn't know who she was. And the Jews knew who she was, but didn't possess her. In other words, if you would walk in, so he was imprisoned in the shrine of Shanstachova, which I totally recommend for anyone wanting to see goddess ritual taking place in a, in a putatively normative Christian environment today. I went there, I, when I learned Polish, I was living in Poland and it's an incredible pilgrimage site. The veneration, the, vener, the pilgrimage is to a portrait of the Virgin Mary. And it's the portrait that is venerated, not the fact that it's the Virgin Mary depicted in the portrait. The portrait is believed to have kind of magical power and protective power. And to go there, you know, I went, you know, whatever it was five years ago and to watch pilgrims of, you know, pious, really pious and, and very devoted pilgrims venerating this depiction of the Virgin Mary in wood um, was remarkable to me in the 21st century. Frank couldn't, you know, sort of couldn't believe it, that here was the veneration of the of the divine feminine, of the goddess, which was the center of the sort of Sabbatean Kabbalah that he'd been familiar with, but was always abstract, right? There's no statue of the goddess in until the 20, until now, now there is, but until, you know, that wasn't part of Kabbalistic practice. And there it was um, in, in the center of Catholic Poland. And so for post hoc, he said, he said, well, of course, this was to this was to reach the maiden. My whole quest was to reach the maiden. And here she is trapped in a pole, in a in a portrait. Um, at the time, though, I think it was a little more opportunistic to save their lives. Uh, but there was precedent for that because Shabtai Tzvi and the whole community of the Dharma had done that a uh, hundred years prior. And so there was an idea that um, there were there were 
I want to say it's only opportunism. Frank has a wonderful teaching in his text where uh, from behind a wall, you know, there's a tree that from behind a wall looks like three trees. But if you can get from get to the other side of the wall, you see that it's really just three branches or three trunks of one tree that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So this wonderful sort of universalist idea. Uh, and um, that is... Uh, authentic. I don't think that was just, you know, just for expediency. So it was a mix of, of those different motivations. Thank you so much. Jay, if, if nobody has a, another question, I have one, but uh, go ahead. Just because we're at the Graduate Theological Union. Um, how does so this go for it? <laughs> how does this um, how does this strike you as a particularly as an episode in Jewish Christian um, relations connections whatever and also okay this is also a two parter whichever one you want to answer I actually was in Poland twice this summer and was astonished at the liveliness and interest in Jewish studies at various universities and these festivals. And it really seems like Poland is the place at which the most exciting work in Jewish studies is being done. And something, and it's also about Jewish Christian relations because most of the people doing this work are not Jewish. So I'm curious what you think of uh, what's going on in Poland and also the Jewish Christian angle. Well, it's fun to have the the Frankist studies angle on that. So um, Ada Mickiewicz, the sort of national poet of Poland, like the great hero, am I allowed to? He was a Frankist. <laughs> he came from a Frankist family. Amazing. His Frankist themes no in his idea. work. He has it's it. There are numerous of number of his poems which can only be understood in terms of Frankist and Sabbatean symbolism. He has all kinds of. He also was, you know, a a spokesperson for a certain kind of tolerance, uh, also around Judaism, Jewish Christian relations, um, to an extent. Uh, you can't really say, say that too much at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, which is where I was, and I was there before the current right wing, uh, you know, party has been in power for the last few years. Uh, so there are parts of Jewish Christian, the Jewish studies that are now, you know, either fetishized or beloved in, in contemporary Poland. Uh, and there are parts which are still a little beyond the pale, no pun intended. Um, I think I'm in the latter. Uh, the Frankist, so there was in the, after the Frankist, after Frank's death, you know, there were thousands at this point, tens of thousands of members of this community who rapidly assimilated in Poland to become kind of part of the professional class. There was a, an idea that you, in late 19th century Warsaw, you couldn't get a lawyer who wasn't a neophyte. A neophyte was a descendant of a converted Jew. Uh, converted, you know, converted Jew is part of Frankism. Um, they were also subject to all kinds of anti-Semitism for that reason. You're not really Christians. You're secretly venerating your crazy Messiah. And some of the first work on Frank that came out was from that community in the form of apologetics. Um, when talking, for example, about sexual ritual, one of the one of the possibility, possibilities is actually there was much more and much more discussion of it. It only just got censored by, by the descendants who were scandalized uh, by this part of their past. We'll probably never know if that's the case. Um, but that community, so the neophyte community, the descendants of Frank um, and, and his disciples uh, became a kind of outsider inside in a certain way. They were Christian, but sort of sort of still Jewish, and they bore a lot of the brunt of that anti-Semitism. I can't help but uh, include the um, the anecdote that in the Prague Frankist community included the Dembitz family uh, and their descendant, Justice Brandeis, had a portrait of Eva Frank on his desk at the Supreme Court. Uh, so bringing my my little law degree background together with, with oh, my law degree. Oh, my God. The many that chapters part? of Jay's That was like, another oh, chapter. <laughs> another chapter. So that and, you know, there is. In the early period in the 1750s, it's clear that the Sabbateans and the Frankists were pawns. 
of, uh, and this is also really well captured in the Tokarczyk novel in the books of Jacob. There, are, the, the bishops and the clergy in general had their own agenda. They wanted to be seen as successfully converting the Jews. And this was a feather in their cap that so many could be, could be converted. And there were disagreements within the hierarchy about how this was to be. And you know, this was also, Pavel, as continue, Pavel Macheco has continued to write on the Jewish Christian relations aspect of this. This was also an, a huge uh, outbreak of anti-Semitism around the blood libel and uh, and so on. And, and Pavel's now traced kind of where the blood libel shows up and where it doesn't in in Polish uh, Polish history, um, yeah. I'll I'll leave that leave that there on that subject. Thank you, Karen. I see you have a question. Yes, I do have a question. I'm wondering. So basically, all of this was super new to me, and I'm interested if you have any suggestions of uh, where I can look for more information, especially about the queerness of Shabbatite Svi and sort of all of the ritual things that were going on? So great question. Um, now I can plug the book. <laughs> so that, uh, but beyond that, uh, I have a disappointing answer, uh, which is that the best scholarship on this is only in Hebrew. So I don't know if you can read Hebrew academic writing. If you can, you're in luck. Uh, Avram El Kayam has done a number of studies of the sort of sexual ritual among the Dernma and also the, the queer aspect in particular. One book that's available in English is uh, Cengiz Sisman's book, uh, The Burden of Silence, which is about that, the, that community, the Dernma community. It doesn't focus on issues of sexuality, but it, it includes them. It does not have a queer lens, but does talk about the sexual rituals uh, that took place. And, um, you know, these are, these are, uh, these rituals took place for hundreds of years, right? It wasn't just a one-off, right? There's the festival of the lamb, the festival of the putting out of the lights. These are all sexual antinomian rituals that continued in this community for hundreds of years. Um, maybe get re, uh, you know, revived uh, in the contemporary period as well. Um, but I think, and and what we could try to do is uh, there's a wonderful young scholar named Hadar Feldman Semet who is writing on Sabbatean hymns. She hasn't yet focused on the sort of homoerotic ones. I've been kind of nudging her to <laughs> maybe do that. Uh, but her mastery of you know these are in Ladino, which I don't I don't uh, I don't have Ladino, and and uh, she does. She's a, an incredible scholar, and her work on the Sabbatean hymns so far has been has been really remarkable. Um, so that's, those are a few places uh, to continue, but I, I acknowledge the disappointment of the fact that the best scholars are doing the work in Hebrew. There's another strange book by a scholar named Eli Shai uh, that's uh, the subtitle, the title in English would be The Messiah of Incest, uh, and it's about Shabtai Tzvi and focuses on Eros, but that's also actually only in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it's uh, Mashiach Shel Gilui Ariot, which has a little broader meaning than incest. Um, so I, I, I want to totally get to Eli Andrew Raymer's uh, question, especially because it's nice to see you and I love seeing each other at our book launches through CLGS. If it weren't for CLGS, our friendship would, wouldn't have as many uh, colorful moments in it. So thank you. Um, there is a lot about Frankist, Frankism and Frankist history and Sabbateans that is just too unbelievable to believe. So probably many of you have heard the anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that Jews, a conspiracy of Jews and Freemasons brought about the French Revolution. There is a grain of truth to that conspiracy theory in the Frankist movement. Uh, the Frankist movement, late Frankist movement, was connected to Masonic lodges and to other Western esotericist societies, and they were running weapons from the Habsburg Empire to the French revolutionaries. That is, that is a fact. That did happen. That didn't cause the French Revolution, <laughs> uh, but it is actually true. David Icke, one of the most horrifying contemporary anti-Semites who has many, many followers, really does know his Frankism and Sabbateanism. I don't know where he's getting it from, where he's learning about it, but he actually is correct on a lot of what he talks about, about these movements. And what you said about uh, that Ataturk and many of the founders of the Turkish Republic came from Derma families is absolutely true. Um, again, The Burden of Silence has that. There's another book. I'll get to it. It's uh, Mark Bear's book. There's a book on the Young Turks, which talks about it family by family. Uh, the Turkish revolution, uh, the secularist Turkish, secu this Turkish secularism was basically invented by the Dernma, by secret Sabbateans who had converted outwardly to Islam. Probably not a coincidence that people who travel across these boundaries between religious communities 
had the idea that maybe we didn't need to have such strong boundaries between religious communities. Um, and uh, uh, virtually all of the young Turks who, who were instrumental in the birth of modern Turkey came from Dermna families. That too was stigmatized for a while. And so a lot of that was hidden, right? It wouldn't be necessarily so great for a modern Islamic Turkey ruled by you know much more conservative factions to say that their country was birthed by quasi Jews. Uh, but historically, uh, that is uh, the case. And so now that I know that you have a Turkish family, uh, Eli, I'm really excited to think that you yourself may be a descendant of Shabtai Tzvi, and we'll talk about that later. <laughs> you can unmute if the answer is yes, because I'd be very excited to hear that. Well, it's lovely to see you. I enjoyed both your conversations, and honestly, my given Hebrew name is Shabtai. <laughs> I think I remember that. <laughs> so uh, in... Uh... In the weeks leading up to this uh, program, I received an email from a lesbian rabbi chiding me for uh, CLGS sponsoring this talk, saying that we really should have nothing to do with Frankism. Um, if, uh, you know, obviously from a historian, you know, as what Naomi called sort of like a straight academic perspective, we can um, just say, well, from a straight academic perspective, we study everything. But from a Jewish spiritual perspective, do you think that Frankism has anything to offer us? I, I think the answer is yes. So first is a sort of meta answer, and it's what we were kind of talking about a little bit earlier. I, I just, I think we, uh, uh, it's hard to kind of articulate this in a way that doesn't sound angry, but we, I think we just need a grown up way of interacting with our own history. Right, there is nothing in the history of any Western religion that is free from problematic aspects. As terrible as Frank's exploitation uh, of members of his community was, it wasn't the Frankist community that were killing homosexual people. Right, I, I, I so uh, yes, I, you know, I think there, there's there's some notion that you know, and and we saw this a little bit too. I think with some of the early feminist uh, re reclamations of Kabbalah. I don't think anyone who was doing reclaiming of what sort of divine feminine language in the Kabbalah was blind to the fact that the Kabbalah is also misogynistic, gender essentialistic, deeply problematic, ethnocentrist, and all of the other problems with Kabbalah. The understanding is that, again, we're diving into a wreck. Not everything in a shipwreck is, is treasure. Uh, and that is that has long been that poem has long been my kind of watchword for how to do Jewish studies and Jewish and the search for a usable past. And that's true here as well. So I'm not here to uh, promote Jacob Frank as a paragon of virtue. He definitely was not that. But there's a lot here that I think is is quite powerful. Uh, just the just the core humanistic antinomianism. Uh, that I'm not that there there is something about there is something that is holiness, but as Mary Oliver said, you don't have to. I'm going to mangle this poem, but right, you don't have to walk on your knees for a, for a thousand miles, you know, repenting and so forth. That's my religion. That's also Frank's religion. Um, and you know, I read Mary Ol that Mary Oliver poem every year at this time of year when a lot of folks are getting involved in repentance and atonement and Yom Kippur and fasting and beating their chests and so forth. And, and so for me, anytime there's an articulation of the folly of that, that's something that's interesting to recover. Um, so that's that is that one piece. I think there's also, as I the last chapter of the book is about how Frank re can, sort of prefigured some of these later movements. Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi has a fascinating essay called, originally called Re Renewal is Not Heresy. Later, called, he retitled it, or someone else retitled it, actually, Renewal is Judaism Now. Which I don't like that title. I like Renewal is Not Heresy, because in it he says Renewal is Heresy. Not only does he say it's heresy, he says it's a bigger heresy than Shabtai Tzvi, because Shabtai Tzvi and, and Jacob Frank were working on an existing reality map of Jewish messianism, whereas for folks interested in, in Zalman-style Jewish renewal, uh, we're not even playing that chess chess game on that chessboard. Um, that being said, there's so there is there is a, there's an echo. He talks about Reb Zalman talks about how perhaps some of the experience of sexual liberation in the '60s might have seemed similar to what one might have experienced at these earlier movements of all this repressive power and throwing off that repressive power itself being a religious experience. Um, for me, I find that quite interesting to ponder that certainly for my own coming out journey but also not just coming out as as gay but coming out as someone 
who find sexual ritual and sex sacred sexuality to be a resource uh, and a wellspring. And I'm not suggesting that uh, teenagers be used in sexual ritual as in the Frankist community, obviously. Uh, but I am saying that there is something fascinating here. And the same for me is, again, is true in Hasidism. Um, I have a lot of friends who are neo-Hasidic and who are perfectly happy to overlook the horrifying aspects of, of the traditions that they're choosing to, to, take, to take aspects from. For me, I'm more interested. I wrote, it just came to me, Nomi, when we were talking before. In 2003 or 2004, I wrote an essay called Hasidism and Homoeroticism after I went to the tomb of Shimon Bar Yochai and had never been in such a homoerotic experience in my life outside of maybe a circuit party with all of these undulating men pushing against each other and being incredibly aroused in a sort of spiritual erotic way. This is obviously a very male piece. I wrote it in 2004. I'm not sure I'd write that same piece today, but there was a there was a kind of power that was in that experience that I still find really interesting along with its problematic aspects in Jewish renewal as well, which also has filled with all kinds of problems around the boundaries around Eros. But I'm excited that the heresy of Jacob Frank can still antagonize a rabbi enough to send an angry email. That makes me feel good that there's still some, there's still some, uh, you know, juice in it, that if, if we're not doing, we're, we're not, it's not totally forgotten if it can still piss someone off that much. Any last words, either of you? Well, I would, I really oh. want to thank you. Oh, Go for well, it. I was looking at Nomi Square there because I was waiting for it. <laughs> I, I, I just, I, uh, anyway, it's just been a real treat. To have yeah, you. just really inspiring, Jay. It's great to see you play in this particular sandbox. And um, I know that there will be some cross fertilization between your strictly academic work and your constructive theology. And it's going to be really exciting to see that blossom. Thank you, that means a lot, I really appreciate it. I, I really wanna thank you both. Um, I, I very much appreciate um, all the work you've both put into um, coming here and giving us such an excellent program. It, I, as I said, to, wrote to both of you, it's programs like these, these sort of intellectual ones that, that seem to be a, a little more hidden in a, in, in a certain way from our perspective, uh, more uh, queer, and as a in terms of our programming, that um, really excite me, and I I just feel proud and pleased that CLGS could um, present this today. We have a, a couple um, programs coming up that I'd like to, to pitch. Um, uh, I also have a book that just came out, um, which is called Transkite, which is a uh, um, that it's liberating gender for Jews and allies, um, the wisdom of Transkite. Uh, the West Coast book launch is uh, Sunday, September 18th as part of Slichot. And uh, it's 21 essays uh, from trans and non-binary Jews and allies uh, explaining uh, various things, pieces of ritual, theology, their lives, arts, and how to be a good ally to trans Jews. Uh, and we will have probably about half of the authors are able to be with us. And uh, it's uh, Sunday, September 18th at 6 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. And I hope I hope you'll join us. Uh, also, uh, I'm delighted that our Georgia Harkness lecture, which is um, our, um, our, our preeminent lecture by uh, a woman scholar in its design to raise up uh, women's theological voices will be uh, Julia Watts Belzer, who is um, really a, a brilliant theologian and also a beloved friend. And she's speaking on a, a topic that she knows very well, which is what she calls crypt theology and about how um, and she'll be speaking on it from a Jewish perspective. So it's part of uh, also our Jewish query series, how Jewish query series, how Jewish texts and Jewish history, as you say, Jay, diving into that rack, um, can bring us some insights onto um, disability uh, within uh, spirituality. 
And again, I want to thank you all for being here. Bernie, did you have any last things you wanted to say? Uh, no, nothing. Just uh, thank you to, to Jane to Naomi. Thank you, everyone, for um, attending. And please check out CLGS.org. We have a lot of programming this fall. And uh, thank you, Jane, for organizing this. Congratulations on the book, Jane. Thank you. Superstars, Jay and Jane. <laughs> so oh, I also.